Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we are starting out on Broadway. Longest, widest passageway on an Iowa-class battleship. This football field length passageway is here specifically so that you can access all of the magazine spaces and more importantly, all of the engineering main spaces. So all four fire rooms and all four engine rooms are accessed off of Broadway. And that's what you're seeing as you look down this hall of mirrors. Every bulkhead you see is the end of one of those main spaces. So uh, we've been getting a lot of questions lately that are about the basics, let's call them. So this video, we've probably done one like it years ago. Please don't go back and watch the first three or 400 videos. They're not that great. Uh, some would say that they're still not that great, but. Hi, my name's Ryan Szymanski, curator of the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Welcome to Broadway. Broadway is the longest, widest passageway on the ship. Definitely don't go back that far. Um, anyway, because we've been getting so many questions about these, we're going to go back to the basics in today's episode and uh, just do a brief overview of the main propulsion plant on Iowa-class battleships. So, Iowa-class battleships have two rudders that steer the ship and four propellers that propel the ship. Those are what move the ship through the water. The propellers also have a number of alternate names, such as props and screws. They're all equally valid. Everybody knows what you're talking about when you use any of them. These propellers come in two separate sizes. There are the outboard blades that are four bladed and 18 feet in diameter approximately. And there are the inboard blades that are five bladed and a little over 17 feet in diameter. The Navy did a bunch of tests on their fast battleships to figure out what configuration would cause the least amount of vibration. Obviously, vibration being transmitted through the propellers through the hull of the ship is a bad thing. It's inefficient. It deteriorates your propellers. And it makes fire control really difficult as you're looking through your, your optical range finders and everything's vibrating. Uh, so that was an early problem with American fast battleships that uh, is mostly mitigated by the Iowa class with this propeller arrangement. We've talked about propellers in other videos. not going to go into that too far. Each of the four propellers is fed from its own separate engine room. And unlike on earlier fast battleships, each engine room has its own fire room. It's not all combined into one main space. That would make an area with so much internal volume that if the armor is defeated, it would flood a significant amount of the ship. So the Navy had the extra weight to put in additional bulkheads to subdivide it. So each engine room has four turbines two ship service turbo generators making electrical power, and two turbines that are attached to a gear reduction box that are attached to the propellers. That's what creates our propulsive power. Each engine room is fed from its own fire room, and each fire room has two boilers. We're going to start in one of the fire rooms and then follow that all the way through and look at some of the major equipment in there. So let's get started in a fire room. Are you interested in taking a deep dive in our engineering spaces? There are about 1,600 rooms on an Iowa-class battleship. It's way more than you can see in a single visit to the ship. But tickets are expensive. Another way you can support the ship and also be able to come back time after time to see more and more of the vessel is by buying a membership. Battleship New Jersey has a number of membership opportunities all of the money donated to get a membership goes back into the museum and maintaining and operating the ship. And it'll allow you to come back for free as often as you like uh, throughout the year that the membership lasts. There's a link in the description below for the uh, membership page if you're interested and want to sign up for one. We've just stepped into fire room number two, home of boilers number three and four. And this one that we're looking at is boiler number three. If you look through that bulkhead, 
Right through that door is Broadway. On the other side of that door is a second entrance to this space. And that's where boiler number four is. So these are Babcock and Wilcox M type boilers. They are heating water up using boiler feed water, air, and bunker C as built or Navy distillate, essentially diesel, as upgraded in the 1980s. They're using this to create combustion, heat, that will then boil the water. And the water gets up to 850 degrees and 600 PSI to become superheated steam that we can then throw against the turbine blades to move the ship. On this level of the fire room, you can see the economizers that are essentially using the hot exhaust gases coming out of the fire down below to preheat the feed water as it first comes into the boiler. You can also see the steam drum on this side, which is where the steam goes as it's being generated. Steam rises to the top, the water uh, goes down lower, and then that's where it's heated in the firebox. So let's head down one level. Remember to hold your breath, we're going underwater here. Each fire room has a single deaerating feed tank. The water is being cycled through the boilers to turn into steam, into the turbines, through condensers, and then back to the boilers. The problem is along the way, it's picking up non-condensable gases. And these gases form bubbles, and uh, that causes all sorts of problems to our plumbing and our turbines if those uh, bubbles are being shot at 600 PSI against things. So the deaerating feed tank here uh, removes those non-condensable gases. There is one in each fire room. So each deaerating feed tank is feeding two boilers. The next thing to notice here is the water tubes. The water that the boilers use, boiler feed water, Navy's not very creative when it comes to naming things, is uh, specifically refined to remove as many impurities as possible because when you boil it, it uh, will leave those impurities in the boiler and it gunks it up. As it is, you have to clean out the boilers completely, like shut it down, take it offline, uh, roughly every 1600 hours of operating it. Uh, and every four hours of operating it, you have to blow down your tubes. So uh, the water tubes here are where the boiler feed water is segregated. And part of that is to keep it from mixing with anything else. Part of that is uh, you're putting it in contact with a lot of metal surface that's gonna heat up and that's gonna be more efficient in heating your water into superheated steam. Now we're at the face of one of our boilers. We've got a light off port down here where you would take your boiler light off rod to get this thing going. And then you've got your various fuel nozzles. Here on the saturated steam side, each of our eight boilers has five nozzles that you can see. The water comes down and uh, is heated here first. Remember I called these uh, Babcock and Wilcox M type boilers. The M is more or less the shape that the water tubes are going in. So the first loop of that M is coming around this saturated steam side and being heated first off. Well, if we've got a saturated steam side, we've also got a superheated steam side over there. There's four more burners. So nine burners total for each of the eight boilers. And that's the second loop of the M is them going over that. And that's removing all the moisture so that it becomes 99% dry steam. Remember, we don't wanna shoot non-condensable gases against our turbine blades. We also don't wanna shoot water droplets at 600 PSI against our turbine blades. Even though they're steel, uh, that water will still punch through it and cause all sorts of damage. Now, the burners here are water spraying fuel into the boilers. So here is your nozzle. You can remove that and put a bigger atomizer on there that sprays more fuel, you go faster. You can remove that and put a smaller one on there and you'll burn less fuel and be more efficient. Every time you change speed or every four hours just to clean these out, you've got to swap them out. Doing that, you would be wearing your asbestos gloves for safety, and then you would take the red hot burner out of the fire, essentially, drop it over here, and pull another one out. Uh, when that cools off, you'll put it on the workbench here, use a wrench to crank this off, 
And then this vat will be filled with a kerosene or another thin oil uh, that'll help clean off the, this gunky burner. And then once it's soaked a little bit, the, the Bunker C is really gunky. It's got the consistency of chocolate pudding at room temperature. It's nasty stuff, barely refined, but you can get it all over the world, which is important when the United States is fighting in World War II, and these ships are designed to be forward deployed. Uh, so you get that off, um, wrench it apart, clean it up real good, and then it goes back into the drawer here, and you've got all of your various nuts, nozzles, and uh, fittings are stored there. Then you got the most important piece of equipment in the whole space, the coffee maker. One other thing that's down here are your periscopes. You've got one for each side of the boiler here. This is to watch what color smoke you're making. Uh, earlier dreadnoughts burning coal will make black smoke that can be seen over the horizon. But oil-fired ships, at least non-Russian oil-fired ships, can get their fuel to be a clear haze that you can't really see. You do this by adjusting your fuel air mixture for each nozzle. When you get that just the perfect way, it'll be a clear haze through here. So there's a light in the back of each periscope, and you're just watching the smoke go over that light. And then that tells you what color it is. The other important thing down here is the engine order telegraph there, which is how you know how fast you're supposed to go. The bridge will ring down. Remember, there's a fire going on right there. This is quite loud. Uh, so they ring down. That rings a bell in the space to let you know uh, that they want something to change. And that tells you how much steam you need to make. Now, like I just said, there's a fire in there. It's real hot in here. So you'll notice these air ducts all around the space. The Navy added air conditioning to the ship, but never in the engineering spaces. It was always going to be 120 degrees down here with, with the fire going. There was no point in even trying to air condition it. So they added forced draft ventilation, which is essentially steam from this boiler runs up and powers a fan on the main deck that's then sucking air down here. We're in the South Pacific in World War II. It's 90 degrees outside. Well, that's still cooler than uh, it is in this fire room. So you can stand your entire four-hour watch right here. From here, I can see my pressure and temperature gauges. I can see my engine order telegraph. I can adjust my feed water. I can adjust my oil. I can adjust my fuel air mixture. And I can change out my nozzles. And most importantly, I can reach the coffee pot, all from right here. If you look at the deck, you notice that it is a diamond plate pattern. The diamond plate gives you some traction as opposed to bare smooth steel that you would slip on. But notice the plate that I'm standing on that's directly under this air duct. It's what we call a worry plate. It is significantly more uh, worn away, worn smooth, by the boots of multiple generations of American sailors who stood here in the sweltering 120 degree temperatures for four hours at a time, sweating themselves to death and without leaving this position. So. That's this level. Let's head under the boilers down the bilges next. Well, as far as the guys, I mean, being a, a battleship, it's steam powered. So these guys are working in some pretty awful conditions. I mean, underway, when I was qualifying for my swoop in, uh, if we, when we were in the Gulf, I mean, it, if you didn't step under, uh, underneath what they call the force draft blowers, which is basically a big fan blowing on you, if you were, if you were standing away from one of those fans, I mean, it'd be 120 plus degrees, and it was really hot and comfortable. And these guys had to work in that every day. So now I'm standing under the boiler, and down here, below me, you can see the bilge. That is the very bottom of the ship, or the top of the triple bottom. An unladen Iowa-class battleship will draw 32 feet of water. The lowest six feet of the ship are part of that triple bottom. So we are still 26 feet below the waterline right here. Above me, 
you might have noticed number one propeller shaft coming out of engine room number one forward of us. It runs about 300, 350 feet that way out the back of the ship. And what you're looking at is the actual propeller shaft. It's not any sort of protective housing. So if we were moving, that would be spinning at uh, up to about 202 RPM, which is why it's got the candy striping on there so you can tell how fast it's going. The other important features in this space, and again, we, we are directly under the boiler. These frames are what are supporting the boilers above us. And Iowa-class battleships create 212,000 horsepower, the most of any battleship ever built. And with only eight boilers doing that, we've got some of the largest ever put on a ship. Uh, but the important stuff beneath the boilers, besides that propeller shaft running aft, are all of these pumps. So for example, we've got three main feed pumps right here, and these are what are drawing the water out of the condensers and pumping it up to the boilers. There's also booster pumps over there. That big blue pipe right there is what is taking the water up to that deaerating feed tank. The other important thing down here is an escape trunk. That escape trunk leads up about four stories back to Broadway. If this space starts to flood, which is always possible, the bulkhead back there is the uh, port side of the ship. The bulkhead on this side is the starboard side of the ship. That is the inside of our torpedo defense. And we're right above the triple bottom. If any one of those three areas is defeated, the space starts to flood. If any of these white pipes are broken, defeated, damaged in any way, uh, the space will start to flood if it's a water pipe, or uh, there will be high pressured steam coming through there, scalding everyone down here. So, rather than having to run back up the way I just came down, there is an escape trunk to get us up out of here quickly. Next, we're going to go into the engine room. Like I said earlier, each engine room and fire room is separated by watertight bulkheads. For the tour, we cut out a doorway here with the permission of the Navy and the State Historic Preservation Officer so that we don't have to go back up four stories and then come down again. Uh, we're allowed to make changes like this with their permission, assuming we keep the piece that's cut out so that we can weld it back into place if, uh, and make the ship intact again if ever needed. You didn't realize that number five room drives the longest shaft in the ship. The other boiler room's shafts are smaller, the distance out. So our workload is heavier than any of the other three boiler rooms. And being that we had old pumps, uh, you might have to store new pumps or even put a fourth pump in there. But you gotta remember we're driving a, a shaft, you know, 30 inch shaft, maybe, 200, 250 feet longer than anybody else. Yeah. So now we're in the lowest level of the engine room. The most striking features down here are the condensers. These two manganese bronze cylinders are the condensers for the two ship service turbo generators above us. And this big beefy chungus over here is the main condenser for number four main engine. Notice the size of this pipe. That pipe leads to a sea chest, an opening in the bottom of the ship. There's over 130 of those sea chests in an Iowa-class battleship that are allowing water to flow into or out of the ship for various reasons. One of the primary reasons is as a heat exchanger. So we're scooping that cold seawater up in this pipe to put it in the condenser. Here's what happens. The steam goes from the boilers into the turbines. They use all of their force to move the turbine blades to move the ship, and then it becomes dead steam. It's at zero PSI. The condensers are pulling a vacuum, so it sucks the dead steam down into them into water tubes. Remember, we gotta keep it segregated from the unrefined seawater that's got salt in it. The salt would stay behind in the boilers if we heated it. So the dead steam is drawn down into the condensers. This cold seawater runs over those water tubes then there's another hole on the opposite side of the condenser. This comes out again as much hotter seawater, and the dead steam gets converted back into boiler feed water. Once it's feed water again, we can use the pumps, the main feed pumps we just saw, to suck it out of the condenser and back into the deaerating feed tank so we can send it into the boiler again and keep the cycle going, the steam cycle. 
It's an almost perfect loop. However, whenever we blow the ship's whistle, we lose steam. Whenever we blow down the tubes, we lose steam. Um, whenever we use the presses in laundry, we lose some of the steam. So the ship does have three evaporators in other spaces that are making more boiler feed water. And so there are tanks along the side of the ship that form part of our torpedo defense that hold that makeup feed water. And as we start to use some of it or lose it, we're able to pump more makeup feed water into the system. Uh, the only other important features down here are the various pumps that are used. If we're doing more than eight knots, the ship scoops up all the water it needs. If we're doing less than eight knots, we have to use pumps to draw that water into the condensers. Up here, we've got our two ship service turbo generators. Two in each engine room, eight total. Each makes 1,250 kilowatts of power. This power, uh, 10,000 kilowatts total, if all eight are running, is what powers the ship. It's approximately the same as, as uh, a city of 20,000 people would use. Power goes from here over to the switchboard, uh, which is uh, essentially the same thing as the uh, fuse box or breaker box you have in your basement or garage. And from there, it is distributing the power to the various systems. And if something trips, it could trip all the way back here at the uh, board, or it might blow at a fuse somewhere along the line. We make uh, primarily, with these turbo generators, they're making 440 volt, 60 hertz um, AC power, three phase power. And then we've got a variety of transformers and rectifiers around the ship that are changing it to DC and changing it from 440 to 220 and 110, depending on the systems that we're using. So uh, th this ship uses a ton of power, all sorts of types. There are over 1,000 electric motors on this vessel, including these three right here. These are some of our larger ones. These are degaussing motor generators. They will put an electrical charge into the hull of the ship to cancel out our magnetic field. It's very important in a world like the ship was born into in World War II, where magnetic detonators existed for mines and torpedoes. If you can demagnetize the hull, then they have to actually hit you to be set off. It close doesn't count when you're using this. Otherwise, those detonators will sense the magnetic field of the ship from a distance away, and even if the torpedo is going to miss you, it might still explode and do damage. Working past the uh, low pressure turbine and the high pressure turbine here, Talk about those in a second. This is the throttle board. So this is where the guy stands to control number four main engine. Uh, the black wheel is your head throttle. You spin it this way to open valves that allows more steam from the boilers into the turbines. We go faster. Spin it the other way, closes those valves, uh, cuts off that steam, and we'll go slower. If you close this all the way and open your red wheel here, that's your astern throttle. The low pressure turbine has two sets of turbine blades in it. Some of it is set to take uh, a head steam. Some of it is reverse bladed, so it'll take a stern steam. Essentially, if we put the steam into the low pressure turbine backwards, it will spin those astern blades and cause the whole turbine unit to start to spin backwards. That will spin the propeller backwards and uh, it can make the ship sail in reverse. More often than not, though, we're using it as our e-brake to stop faster. From high speed, it takes two and a half miles to come to a dead stop when you've reversed the propellers. These ships have 57,000 tons of inertia times 33 knots. Uh, it's an incredibly fast uh, vessel, and we're moving a lot of weight through the water. A cool feature here is the sound-powered phone booth. These turbines are gonna be really squealing. They're gonna be making a lot of noise. Uh, so when you have to communicate with the other engine rooms, main control and engine room number three, uh, the, the fire rooms that are feeding your boilers, you've gotta come over here uh, where you can actually hear what they're saying by talking to them in the booth. You'll notice there are a couple different types of phones there. Some of them are electrically powered, some of them are sound powered. So depending on uh, how much damage the ship has taken, you might wanna use one or the other. There's also this board over here 
The status board shows you what valves in the engineering plant are open or closed, so you know where the steam is going. If we're rerouting, we're not taking our steam from boilers three and four in, engine, uh, in fire room number two, we're taking it from one and two in fire room number one, then we've got to display that up there so that when I'm relieved after four hours, the next watch stander knows what the system is. That doesn't do anything, just snapping one of these switches to show it's open when it's in line. It is closed now that it is out of line. I haven't closed anything, I'm just showing that that is closed. So I need somebody to call me and tell me they've closed that valve to adjust that because th there's nothing behind this. This isn't powered. This is great depression era technology. So this is your high pressure turbine. The steam goes in there first. Those blades are significantly smaller and they'll spin a lot faster. Once your steam has used most of its power, it is then piped from the high pressure turbine into the low pressure turbine. The low pressure turbine you can see is both uh, longer and a bigger diameter. If we were in a shore based power plant that had infinite room, all the blades would just be stacked up one in front of the other from the smallest to the biggest. We are not. We have a finite amount of length for this space. And so they basically broke the larger blades off and put them side by side instead of just continuing right down the line. The turbines spin at several thousand RPM. But earlier I said our propellers need to spin at about 200 RPM. To do that, each engine features a gear reduction box. Notice this one says number four main engine. Uh, this is essentially the battleship's transmission. It is single speed. Uh, you can go forwards or backwards, but it's just the one speed. And it is stepping down the speed of the two turbines and it is combining, the two turbines have two shafts, one each going into the gear reduction box. It's combining them into a single output shaft, your propeller, and reducing it uh, to only a couple hundred RPM, but that's also increasing the torque so that your propellers bite into the water better and push the ship forward. Now, number four main engine. The engine rooms are numbered from the front of the ship to the back. One, two, three, four. Makes sense. The propellers are numbered from right to left. One, two, three, four. Makes sense. You combine these two systems together and it no longer makes sense. So engine room number one has main engine number one. That goes to the right hand most propeller. Engine room number two has engine number four because it goes to the left hand most propeller. The Navy alternates them to try and keep it balanced, uh, the weight of all the shafting that's going through the ship. Then you got engine room number three. That has uh, main engine number two. And engine room number four, that has main engine number three. Makes perfect sense, right? And don't even get me started. Engine room number one is fed by boilers one and two. Engine number four in engine room number two is fed from boilers number three and four, or in fire room number two. And it just keeps going like that all the way back. Likewise, the turbo generators. Ship service turbo generators number one and two are in engine room number one. Three and four are in engine room two. Five and six in three, seven and eight in four. It takes a while to learn the system here. We've just walked through some of the major pieces of equipment in a single uh, engine room and a single fire room. Most of this stuff is duplicated three more times throughout the engineering plant because this is just feeding one propeller. And that is the equipment it takes to make 212,000 horsepower to move a 57,500 ton fully loaded warship at up to 33 knots as designed, 35.2 knots as actually achieved in service. Since we're going back to the basics every now and again, what are some other systems that uh, you'd like to see a deeper dive on? Let us know in the comment section down below. Uh, even if we've made videos about it in the distant past, uh, we'll, we'll certainly remake them again. We, we keep getting new viewers who need to relearn the basics. So, Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below for more ways you can donate to support the ship. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.